Good evening, everyone. Welcome to KD USA Forum. I am at your own chief representative of KD USA. I appreciate your participation, especially local businessmen, medical professionals, researchers, and scientists. Also, thanks for uh, BioRefs. Akiri is a South Korean government agency which carries out uh, the systematic and professional support for the improvement of public health and enhancement of the international competitiveness of Korea health industry. Kiri has five global business offices, including U.S. office, promoting overseas expansion of Korean health industry and business developing with global partners. 안녕하세요. 보건산업진흥원 미국 지사장 오종입니다. 저희 지사의 일정상 공교롭게도 2주 연속으로 에비나를 진행하게 되었습니다. 지난주에는 매사 추세 주주 보스턴에서 했는데 오늘은 저희 지사가 있는 캘리포니아 LA에서 현지 보건산업체 포럼과 동시에 진행을 하겠습니다. 한국 보건산업체의 경우라면 미국에 출장 오지 않고도 자신의 데스크톱이나 모바일로 톱클래스의 전문가의 발표와 최신 정보를 시청하고 Q&A에 동참 가능한 실시간 온라인 세미나입니다. 특히 오늘 한국에서 금요일 오전 시간인데도 불구하고 접속해 주신 모든 분들께 감사드립니다. 오늘 웨비나는 주미국 대한민국 대사관이 주관하고 한국보건산업진흥원 미국지사가 주최함을 알려드립니다. 특히 웨비나 기획을 총괄해 주신 주미대사관 신고식의 복지관님과 장, 어, 발표 장소를 협찬해 준 바이오 랩스 LA에 심심한 감사 말씀을 올립니다. 어, 지금 어, 포럼이 진행되고 있, 있는 곳은 바이오 랩스 LA입니다. 어, LA 카운티가 조성 중인 바이오 클러스터 내 어, 신설된 첨단 어, 의료 바이오 벤처 시설입니다. 어, 저희 시설 바로 옆에 하버 UCLA 메디컬 센터가 위치하고 있고 어, 다양한 바이오 관련 시설들이 입지하고 있어서 어, 스타트업 기업들에게는 좋은 장소가 되고 있습니다. 아, 이미 한국 기업이 입지에 있습니다. 아시다시피 보스톤이 매우 핫하고 어, 민집된 어, 클러스터이지만 어, 미국의 그 스테이트 비교만 볼것 같으면 어, 캘리포니아주가 2018년도에 NIH 그랜트 측면에서는 그총 39억 달러를 유치해서 미국에서 1위입니다. 그리고 벤처 캐피탈 유치도 76억 달러에 달하고 있습니다. 제가 생각하는 그 캘리포니아의 가장 큰 장점은 연구와 교육 시스템입니다. 특히 23만 8천여 명의 학생을 보유하고 있는 유니버시티 어브 캘리포니아 시스템이 대표적인데요. 현재 세계 100대 우수, 최우수 대학 리스트에 10개가 지금 들어 있습니다. 그리고 특히 그 바이오 사이언스 분야와 엔지니어링 분야 박사 소지자가 미국 주에서 가장 많은 4,600여 명을 보, 어, 보유하고 있습니다. 그래서 한국 기업 입장에서는 어, 한국에서 거리도 가깝고 어, 우수한 동포 2세, 3세를 어, 활용할 수 있다는 측면에서 어, 좋은 대안이 될수 있을 것 같습니다. 어, 오늘 발표를 위해서 LA와 샌디에고 클러스터를 중심으로 활동 중인 두 분을 모셨습니다. 어, 최근 어, 한국에서 화두가 되고 있는 어, 임, 어, 신약 개발에 있어서 임상시험 관리와 아, 그 사례를 어, 중심으로 발표를 하겠습니다. 아, 그런데 어, 원래는 저희가 그 어, 시, 신약 개발에 있어서의 임상시험 관리 어, 전반적이고 포괄적인 어떤 관리 기법을 먼저 말씀드리고 
그 다음에 이그샘플 익스피리언스 쪽을 어, 발표를 하려고 했습니다만 그 연사 사정으로 인해서 어, 후자를 먼저 어, 시작하도록 하겠습니다. Uh, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Stanley Kim. Uh, Stanley Kim is currently the CEO of Win Center, a clinical stage company developing disease modifying treatment for peripheral uh, neuropathy, uh, which means mitral uh, shingyeongjung in Korean. He's fortunate to uh, work with very amazing people. He started his career as an intellectual property lawyer, uh, 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 property attorney, attorney. First, managing the, uh, the uh, intellectual property uh, for the Salk Institute, one of the top uh, five research institutes in the world. His first two companies spun off the Salk in the field of computational uh, neuroscience and uh, machine learning were uh, uh, acquired by Qualcomm and Apple. And the team eventually developed technology now on most cell phones. He also worked as technology advisor to one of the wealthiest healthcare icons. He has started several companies or still looking to be standards. Winsanto is where he now spends most of his time. Uh, his topic is the real life example and experience in clinical trial. Stanley, please have your time. So I have to apologize. We switched uh, presentations. I have, to com I have a conference call in about an hour. So Stan, the other Stan, Stan Fur, the smart one, had, had to go second. And so it'll look good. So that's that's the probably the best part of it. Um, uh, so my center actually stands for Winnipeg, San Diego, Toronto. That's where the founders are from. And so we're trying to treat a disease called peripheral neuropathy. It originally started from a disease called diabetic peripheral neuropathy. But I'll kind of skip through this. And this sorry, this is going to skip. Just make sure that no one thinks that this is an uh, investment opportunity. But anyway, so I got very lucky, like I mentioned. So most of the technologies are actually, I think every cell phone has one of my technologies on it now. The first one was sold to Qualcomm. It's the noise canceling, how you can separate out different noises from different cell uh, on the cell phones themselves. Oh, that's a service at this noise from this noise. And then the second company was sold to Apple, and it's the face ID on the technologies. So that um, closer, further away. Yeah. So I actually don't need a microphone. Really so either way, I got really lucky that the Salk Institute where I was working, everyone had a Nobel Prize except for me. And I kept thinking, well, why don't I have a Nobel Prize? I mean, everyone else does. So I'm, I got to work with really, really smart people. And then I got involved with the TED conferences and, and, and this guy, Patrick Sunshine, who's probably the richest healthcare guy, goes back and forth. He's owns the Lakers here, in the LA Times. So I got to work with really, really smart people. And that was really my only thing to fame. I wasn't smart enough, so I was realized that I had to work with other smart people. So the leading guys in the field of diabetic neuropathy, which is a complication of diabetes, about 50 to 70% of all diabetics, came to me and said, they were given quite a bit of money. There is no other solution for this. So they said, we think we may find something that reverse the disease. Would you like to start a company around this? And they forgot to mention that I wasn't going to get paid for seven years, but that was okay. Because once someone says that they're, they've got a disease modifying treatment, you pretty much drop everything that you're working on and you jump at the opportunity. And so, so this disease is caused by different diseases. Actually, this condition is a complication of other diseases. It's about one in 15 people that affects about several hundred million people. In the US alone, it's about 30 to 40 million people that have this disease. It's about 50 to 70%, depending on which country you're in, a third of all HIV patients, about 30 to 40% of all cancer patients. In fact, really, most cancer drugs today, they can't be used first-line therapy because the neuropathy is so bad for, for the disease. 
but it's also caused by a number of other things. Antibiotics, Humira, uh, toxin, alcohol. So we're talking several hundred million people that actually have this, this problem. And there's zero, there's today, there's no treatment other than pain drugs. And most of these pain drugs, you know, in the news, cause addiction and other problems. And all they, all they do is work temporarily. So I'm going to kind of skip through the science real quickly and um, talk about the company for a little bit because what we're now in phase two and we're actually seeing recovery of the patients. We're actually reversing the disease. We're actually seeing nerve growth. We're seeing function recovery and we have quality of life and, and actually reduced pain. So imagine if this works, it's not just the pain drug that you take once, once a day. It's a pain drug that may you may take for several months and all of a sudden you may actually have to no longer take any of the drugs. And that's interesting because it's a, it's a disease modifying treatment. And so we've been very lucky. We're now in phase two. The other part is because we've been so lucky with our where we've gone, we haven't raised any money yet. This is all money that's coming from the government grants. Almost all the funding to date is, I would say 95, if not more, percent of our funding actually came from grants. The other 5% actually came from our service providers, our friends and family, and then actually we started getting checks from patients. And so we didn't know what to do with the checks. We deposited them into a Kickstarter campaign and allowed them to go ahead and become, um, to become owners of the company because they're going to hold our feet to the fire like no one else will. Patients are actually, and this is where we realize that we have to be a patient-oriented company. And so we are very much a patient-oriented company. And this is where it's different than other pharma companies. So here we are in phase two, and we've got a, a pretty phenomenal story. It's half glass full, half glass empty. So the half glass full is we're in phase two, haven't raised any money yet, and we've got a disease modifying treatment. We took it all, and, and to get to there, we found a brand new mechanism, reformulated, repurposed an existing drug with 30 years of safety, and then decided to actually go ahead and go forward with this. Again, you've got 30 years of safety on this drug, and well, what better, I mean, if you're a patient, that's what you want to hear, a very, very safe drug. We made it topical, which even makes it safer. It's something that's more user-friendly, and we, here's a guy from, from the startup world, all about lean startups, always building towards your customer. And our, in our world, customer is patients, doctors, hospitals. So you go to these conferences, and then you actually hear about what is really is important for them, and it's completely different. We have a repurposed, reformulated drug, which means that we have less IP. Branding mechanism means unknown studies. Everything is, everything is, is you know, you can't make as much money from these. So all these little things, you realize that it's, it's really perspective. Is it good or bad? And it depends on where you are. And this is actually how it dictated our clinical trials. And so this is all about clinical studies and which way we decide to go versus everyone else. Um, and so if you actually look at the market, 50% of all drug sales are here in the US. That's it's pretty significant. So if you actually look on the far left is the world total. The one, the columns next to it actually are US. So 50% of all drug sales are here in the US. It subsidizes the rest of the world, which means that if you're a pharma company, you've got to kind of develop for the US market. And you have to realize that's where you're, you're going. And so when we first started looking at our clinical studies, we want to know where, what we should develop. Should we develop a brand new drug? And I'll, I'll kind of explain what, why. We found a brand new mechanism, so we, have to, you know, we could have developed a brand new drug and old, uh, use an existing drug. We had to raise a lot of money. This is very typical. It's not unusual for companies nowadays to raise $100 million for the Series A. You get diluted 80%, 90% on your first round. And then that's just for, that's a preclinical. And then you got to go raise, you, you hear about these companies that are actually raising $100 million, or I'm sorry, a billion dollars to just get a drug approved. That's a lot of money. In the tech world, that wouldn't happen. It, it actually starts slower and then ramps up in toward the end. In the, in the biotech world, it's completely different. You raise a lot of money up front, and then you go ahead and even raise more money later on. So, and then if you actually look at the industry itself, where is the focus? The focus is all on phase two. So when IPOs go big, if you actually look, it's really preclinical and, and uh, phase two, where the valuations are the highest. And that actually is, is generally true with, with, with the industry, the biotech industry. And these are the little things that I learned as we were progressing through the clinical trials. So if you actually then look at where the jumps are, the valuation jumps are, again, it's preclinical, phase two. And if you're in phase three, you're, it's too late. So you actually look at the valuation jump over the last four years, phase three, you're, 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 the question is, why didn't you get bought out? It must be because you, you have a bad drug. 
sorry, I'll, I talk really fast. I'll, I'll try and slow down. So, and that was interesting for us because again, what do we want to do? Because our company still, think about it, we're still owned by doctors, clinicians, researchers, and myself. And we're all about patients. And so we opted, forget this, we're not going to worry the public, we're not going to worry what our investors want, and we're going to make sure that our drug works. And this is where our clinical protocol came about and how we've actually advanced forward to phase two now with a pretty interesting story. So, oh, sorry, this is actually uh, the other stand slide. And this is the other part. It, you know, everyone talks about innovation, 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 and the difficulty of developing a drug. It is a lot of money. I, I'm a little skeptical about the actual role numbers. And th again, this is from an outsider, a tech world guy coming into the pharma world. And here's the reason why. Because if you actually look at the real numbers, uh, for example, in 2017, the drugs that were approved, 90% of the drugs were already drugs with other drugs in the same, in the same, with the same medication. And 75 are actually literally just little, literally derivatives of existing drugs. So when you talk about true innovation, five of those, uh, 12 of those drugs were, were, uh, were first in class, but for new indications, there were only five. And, and that, those five were actually all for orphan indications. So technically, it's not really, it's, it's a hot area and everyone wants to develop an orphan indication. So if you're truly someone like, uh, like us, where there's no other companies in the field and you're disease modified for a, a treatment, where there's no other treatments for, we, we had a wall. Every time we talked to an investor, they would, they would say, do you have something in CAR T? or PDL one or immune ecology, or some of these other hot areas. And that wasn't us. We were disease modifying for this disease that happens to treat, you know, that happens to affect one in 15 people. It's a disease of the poor and the elderly. And so unfortunate, it's a complication of X. And oh, that's the other thing is that one of the things that we said, that we didn't treat the underlying disease. We actually work on the nerve damage itself. So, the story of the company itself was started because the top researchers and clinicians were brought together by NIH, juvenile diabetes, and um, Canadian health. There is such a big problem. The, 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 they say diabetes complications is about $250 million, or sorry, $250 billion a year. That's what the damage is. Of that, um, they say about 27% is caused by neuropathy. We have 50 to 70% of all patients. So, because there's such a huge need, there's no other companies in the space, and there've been a lot of failures in the space, the government kind of put the top scientists together and kind of said, look, go form a company. It was more formed as a nonprofit than actually as a for-profit. That, that, that's the origin of the company itself. The science was actually based on reversing mitochondria activity, the energy source for, for this is a little technical or untechnical, depending on where you sit. But, uh, the, but you, what you want to see is that the very the top right, I'm sorry, top left, it shows if you block this, these, these receptors, these, act, uh, these proteins, on the right side, you actually see nerve growth coming back. And that's what we saw. We saw nerve growth. And then subsequently taking more and more money to the point where we were looking at not just if it was truly based on nerve growth, it should work on other indications, different mechanisms, and it kept getting better and better. And we started the story not so much, again, to form a company. We actually tried to kill this at every single point. We all had jobs and we we're doing other things. And the story kept getting better and better and better. And every time we, we were trying to kill the story, it just, kept, it just worked. But, but it was all based on the science itself. We knew that if you get nerve growth, have nerve growth, then it should recover some of the functions. And if it recovers some of the functions, maybe it's not just diabetes and it's not working on the underlying disease. Maybe it works on chemo. It works on HIV. So the story got better and stronger as we progressed. But it was only because we tried to kill this as quickly as possible. So our entire clinical trial protocol was based on how do we kill this as quickly as possible? So then we tried this on humans. And when, and so the discovery was, it was actually not just one drug. It was actually a, an unknown mechanism for an existing target. And that target was one of these GPCRs. It's been around for you know, 100 years, 70 years or so. There's a number of compounds that target that specific receptor. Uh, and rather than developing a brand new drug, we said, why don't we just recycle an existing drug? And, the, and we tested a couple of those. One of those we tested was in humans. And so I don't know if you know anything about p-value, but we looked at four things. We looked at nerve growth, function, quality of life, and then finally, more recently, we actually looked at pain. And so 
if you know anything about p-value of, of pharmaceutical companies, right, you know, of, of clinical trials, p-value means the likelihood of error. Um, There's a more technical term for it, but really what you're looking for is the likelihood of this not being true. And so the closer you get to zero, the better it is. Anything below 0 0.05 is considered really good. In the, in the pharmaceutical world, I've been told that 0 0.001 is near perfect. So you can see that for nerve growth in the active group, it's really strong. In the placebo group, not so much. And then you then go into quality of life, function, and then, and then pain, you actually see really, really strong results for our patient group. Again, this was double-blinded, placebo-controlled. So it gave us confidence to move forward, saying that at least mechanistically, we're on the right track. And this gave us more confidence to actually go and test another drug. This drug itself was a non-selective antagonist, which means that it has side effects. Uh, it was approved here in the U.S., so we can actually proceed. But this other drug, we call it WSD-057, it was a drug that was approved in several countries, Japan, Germany, Austria, never here in the U.S. Efficaciously, it, for the original indication 30 years ago, it wasn't very good. But safety-wise, over the last 30 years, it was phenomenal. Uh, we didn't have any, it was an oral drug. It was used, uh, it was used even in children as an eye drop. So safety-wise, millions of people have used it orally, which means they just swallowed it every day. And it was used every day in children's eyes. So now we, we're, we're taking that same drug and recycling it. And that means for us, repurposing and reformulating. So we went to a topical drug. So now you're taking something that, you, that people would eat every day, and now you're rubbing someone's skin. Again, that was to maximize safety. So we didn't want to, we, we just want to make sure that the story didn't fail. So the science kept pointing us in this direction of this is the direction you should go. Make sure it works, make sure it's safe. And again, and the best part is actually, I'm going to go through this quick. Phase one, phase two, phase three. The, uh, the basis of phase one, phase two, phase three is safety, adverse effects. With the drug that's been running for 30 years, we knew that that was now off the table. All we had to worry about was then, well, we still have to worry about some safety as a topical, but really you focus on the efficacy of the drug. And phase two is interesting because phase two is really just activity. And we've already seen some activity from mechanistically from these class of drugs. So, Going back to the slide, you know, it is true that it's very expensive and it leads to one drug. Our case was different. What we did is we actually took this one drug and actually we knew that it was a safe drug, so we actually pushed it backwards and we used, we proceeded with this. And with this story, we can actually then focus on manufacturing and, um, and we got this where we kept giving grants and all the preclinical work. Again, you're looking for toxicity, uh, you're looking for, and, and, and Stan will tell you some about some of these different things. You're looking for toxicity. You're looking for, uh, you're not really looking for PK as much, PK as absorption and how much gets into the blood because all that work's already been done as an oral drug. So we could bypass a lot of this information. Um, and then, which allowed us to actually go to Australia really quickly. And so Australia is really nice because, again, if you're lean for, from the tech world, you're using every resource you can. If someone leaves a pencil, you take that pencil and you use it. So what we did is in Australia, you get 46 cents back in the dollar. So we kept getting all this money back from the Australian government to continue with our trials. I'm sorry. So allow us actually then go ahead and, and move forward into our phase three and there are phase two. Well, in parallel, the scientists were actually doing the science studies and they were also doing the, the proof of concept study. Again, these were all grant funded, but now it actually provided us a tech. So the great part was this, we have really strong science now. They understand the mechanism even better. They've published this in national journals. We've stayed pretty quiet. We haven't really had to go out and raise a lot of money, so we didn't need to go into the big journals uh, or go into the big publicity hypes. We just have to make sure that the scientific community bought the story. And that's where we've been doing, going to conferences and explain the science. As far as the proof of concept study, it was great because that 46 patients that we studied, it's a great template for how we're going to use this other study. Now we take that same template and we just increase the number from 46 to 120. We do different sites and we just change the name of the drug from one drug to another. And mechanistically in the animals, they all work the same. Well, they all work the way we were hoping to. So this, this again, it provides us the guidance to move forward in our clinical studies as quickly and as securely as possible. And then, again, because we took so many steps in the very beginning to try and kill these projects as quickly as possible, it gives more confidence as we move forward. So here now we're in phase two. We've got strong science. We've got the manufacturing place. Um, we, 
it gives an option now to type other things too, the IP. Uh, and then again, if you're in the product world, you're always worried about manufacturing and the front and the back end. So we had we tied up the API, we tied up the the, the, the back end, and we're tying up all the all the service providers in between. And the other part then is now we've got this validated protocol that we know that works and these endpoints. And so this is the other thing is that the difference, and this is where we were talking to the FDA, is that our endpoints are actually different than everyone else's endpoints. And endpoints, uh, if you don't know what that means, is that those are the markers you're looking for. And now we actually know from these patients, it really works. So when we met with the FDA, they said, at least we have evidence that these endpoints work in humans. If you're going in blindly, you don't know what, what they work or don't work, then you're in trouble. So we're now in phase two, and we're trying to go as fast as we can. And uh, we're starting phase three in China because in China, you actually do one up. So we've already gotten comments back from the FDA. They said they want us to do a full study, 1,500 patients. So that 1,500 patients means it's a very large patient, you know, uh, multiple, multi-center, international study. Interestingly enough, China's gotten really aggressive. And so in China, we're actually looking to do a third of our patients in China. In China, you only have to do one pivotal study. Again, our goal is to get to patients as quickly as possible. I get an email every day from patients saying, where's my drug? Where's my drug? Where's my drug? And that's what drives us. So if that's the case, then we need to make sure that we get our drug out there as quickly as possible. We're not looking at what the market wants. We're not looking at what investors want. We're always looking for what the patients want and the patients want the drug. So in China, we can do one large pivotal study. And actually, that you can use, they're now international standards. So you can actually use that data to go in back into the U.S. Interestingly enough, you can also also do this for other indications as well, too, for chemo. Chemo induced peripheral neuropathy is about 40% get permanent neuropathy. And I mentioned before that uh, not patient, they can't continue with existing drugs. So now we can actually do this for existing drugs, reduce the pain, and much smaller patient populations, doing about 300 patients. And, that, and then because this is a breakthrough, well, hopefully a breakthrough, and also for a true in that need, we accelerated expedited designation, which allows us to go much faster and quicker with the FDA. In fact, we were, I was just talking to uh, the other person. Our, the FDA has been really supportive of us, partly because the other governments have actually been talking to them. The NIH have been talking to them and saying, look, here's this great drug. It's great safety. We'd like to see if this, this can get through faster. The response, the, the notes that we got back from the FDA, two-thirds of it was actually based on what they want to see for a phase three. And I've been told that actually is unusual. Normally, the FDA says, yes or no, we like this, or come back. That's pretty much what they say. They don't give you true guidance. In our case, they actually gave us full guidance of, well, this is what we'd like you to do. And I guess that's unusual. So that's kind of our story of how we are in phase two, haven't raised much money. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't need money, so if anyone wants to give us money, we're, we're happy to take it. But we've been lucky because we haven't had to kowtow to, to investors say, you should do this, you should do that. Because if you look at the market, and they will tell you to focus on cancer or pain. And we've heard this a thousand times. You should do Alzheimer's or you should do this or you should do this. And we said, that's not where the science is taking us. The science is taking us in this direction and this is where we're going. So if you'd like to go with us, great. But if not, I'm sorry. We're, we're going to have to continue. So that's the story of Wits Hentor. I guess uh, thank you question. for your uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, is there any uh, questions in the floor? Well, oh, go ahead. Question. Is this an existing drug that you are repurposing? Yes. So it was a drug that was approved in Japan, Germany, back in the 1980s. And um, it was used... Uh, and this is also interesting. We get feedback all the time. So the drug you can still buy in Japan and Germany, but it you have to take such a high amount that it doesn't work orally. So they get sick. So, but it does seem to work because those patients say that they've got neuropathy. But yeah, so, so neuropathy, you have to understand, is as torturous as it gets. People can't walk. They, I mean, it, it's, it's painful. I get suicide notes about once a month. I mean, people would much rather die than go ahead and live another day. It is horrible. I mean... I mean, there are stories of like people waking up and, and a rat will be chewing on their foot and they won't even know that they're being, the toe's falling off. You can literally cut off a toe and you won't know. And this is actually what's happened with all these people, people who have diabetes. They get the leg cut off because they get these huge infections. They'll, they'll, they'll gash themselves. 
I had one woman who, who had a snake was actually biting her and she, she was walking around with the snake and she didn't even know she, there was a snake biting her. So it's, and then on the other end, it's very painful for a lot of patients. Um, so imagine one in 15 people, but one in eight adults over the age of 40. It's a disease mostly of elderly. They're horrible. So uh, people always say, we go back to your story, we go back to where you were. People have been trying the drug, this oral drug. It doesn't seem, it seems to work for them, but it just causes all the complications. And we've, again, been about patients, so we try and find the safest, most aesthetically pleasing for patients. You know, our ideal customer would be L'Oreal or someone like that, because, you know, it's all about the patients. Go ahead. I also have another question for us. Uh, another major important aspect of FDA approval is the safety yes. of the drugs because it's been obviously existing for some other purposes. Yes. At the level you are looking at, how safe is it? It's is it? Can, low. You, can you win that process? So this is actually also, so, so in our phase two, phase, I'm sorry, phase one, uh, so we were using lower levels of the drug than the oral. Systemically, it was significantly lower than the oral version. That's why you take so much of the oral version. The drug itself is not very systemic. When we actually test on the skin, we actually found that it didn't actually get into the blood. So actually, at first we panicked. And this is actually a good story. When we first got our phase one results, we saw in the blood itself almost one nanogram, which is a very, very, very small amount. And we knew that we needed about four or five times that in the blood from, from the animal studies. It was interesting. When we, when we, after we panicked, we said, well, why don't we do skin biopsies of the patients? And we actually saw 100 to 200 times greater concentration in the skin. And so we see significantly higher levels in the skin. The other interesting thing was that when we actually did biopsies at the site where they applied, and then above the site, we actually saw that it traveled. And so this drug itself is very high, what's called hydrophilic. And so it seems to be traveling through the skin. There's something called the interstitium, the, the liquid part of the skin. It's actually the largest tissue now, largest organ in the body. And it seems to be traveling through, through, the, through, that, through, that, through that organ. Maybe the lymph nodes, we don't really know, but it does seem to be traveling beyond the original site. So it's even safer than we actually imagined. The other reason we chose this drug is because it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So we want to make sure that it doesn't get into the brain. So again, we did this to try and make sure, like, you know, it, it, we had, you know if you had a choice of somebody with 30 years of history or, or I'm going to inject you with HIV, which would you rather do? In the industry, people would say the HIV. In the reality, as a patient, or if, you're, you know, if you have the disease, I'd much rather take something that's topical. It's been around for 30 years. But again, it's perspective. Yes? What do you plan on launching first? Which market? Where, which, which market do you believe you'll be able to launch in first? So it depends on education. So we believe we can probably get chemo and just pulmonopathy before anything else because it's a much smaller patient population. It's also a, uh, what's called breakthrough. Status, so we probably can get it approved in the U.S. for chemo and just and possibly Japan as well. But for diabetic profanopathy, probably China, just because of the new regulations, they're trying to push it as fast as possible. Uh, in the U.S., we have to do two, um, but and then uh, U.S. one. But this is also where we've been using patient advocacy groups, doctor groups, hospitals to try and help us push through the FDA. The FDA has been very, 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 very supportive of trying to make sure that drug, this drug gets approved as fast as possible in the U.S., maybe on par with what we see in China. So, we don't, but the answer is I actually don't know. So, we're just, we're just running. And we have a small team, and we're just, it's hard to run with so many people. Yeah, any other, one more question? Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, 다음으로는 어, 두 번째 연자를 소개해 드리겠습니다. Uh, 현재 그 파락셀 인터내셔널의 부대표이신 스탠포드 지 박사님이십니다. 아 uh, 스탠포드 지 박사는 임상 약학자로서 어, 이, 약 25년 이상 의료 바이오 업계에서 활동을 하셨고 어, 어, 교육은 USC에서 어, 박사를 하셨고요 그리고 포스트학을 어, 완료하셨습니다 아, 그리고 네권의 책과 75편의 논문을 작성하셨습니다 
현재 그 LA 지역의 동포 과학자로서 어, 지속적인 지원 활동도 어, 벌이고 있습니다. 아. 지박사님의 오늘 그 프리젠테이션은 Why do drugs fail? How to mitigate risk in clinical trial uh, drug uh, development입니다. 아, 아까 말씀드렸지만 예, 신약 개발에 있어서 임상시험 위험 관리에 대해서 말씀해 주시겠습니다. 부탁드리겠습니다. 굿 이빙, 음, can everybody hear me in the room? Is this okay? Okay, all right. So I am very honored and happy to be here tonight um, here in Los Angeles and good evening to you all. And also I understand there are uh, many, many participants uh, in Korea uh, this morning, Friday. So I'll be presenting uh, mostly in English but uh, for those who are just English speakers, uh, I'd like to um, get your understanding for my mixed language. Uh, I will be presenting in both uh, English and Korean. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully that's okay with our English speaking audience. So I have a very big topic today. I was asked to talk on the topic of why drugs fail and how to get risk, mitigate, uh, mitigate rather, risk in clinical drug development. Uh, if I only had the answer that I could answer in 30 minutes, uh, uh, that would be wonderful, but this is a very big question. So I would like to introduce the idea of some of the milestone decision one has to make in order to make go-no-go decisions in this long journey of drug development. So with that said, I'd like to go to the first slide. Now, I understand that in the audience, there are a wide range of people from uh, legal companies, marketing, uh, to technical companies. So I would like to cover both broad topics as well as technical topics uh, for those that are in on the grounds doing pharma drug development. So please uh, understand the wide nature of our audience. Uh, so if you look at it, it's about 10 years, okay? We have the basic researchers. Without the basic researchers who are in academia, NIH government, we will not have drugs, right? So we have to give credit where it's due with our academic colleagues who are doing the R or the research component of drug development. After basic research, we move on to drug discovery. And of course, there's a preclinical stage where we have to use animal models to test new compounds. Where I spend most of my time is in clinical trials or human trials. And uh, we divide that into three phases and I'll go over some of the objectives of these phases. And then we go to the FDA review and uh, of course uh, uh, approval to the FDA. Now this whole process takes about 10 years and is averaging about two and a half billion. That's what a B, not an M, okay? Two and a half billion dollars. Uh, but that is both direct and indirect cost. So we're talking about a billion or more of direct cost. And this two and a half really talks about all the uh, indirect costs that's involved in making one drug successful. Now, even if you're in phase one, and let me just uh, review the phase one, two, and three objectives. Uh, phase one, generally speaking, is to evaluate the safety and the tolerability. And the drug's behavior, uh, whether it gets absorbed through the skin or through oral routes, through the gut, does it go into the brain, et cetera. Phase two is kind of a proof of concept stage where you want to get a signal of whether the drug has a possibility or not. And phase three is when you want to confirm 
one of the drugs is efficacious. Now, even if you have a drug in phase one, the success rate of passing the phases or phase three is about 12%. So maybe one in 10 drugs uh, that enters phase one will survive the phases to get approval. And a typical application um, uh, for an NDA, new drug application, uh, is about 100,000 pages. Now, that's a lot of data. That's about, you know, those grocery trucks, uh, the 18 wheelers. Yeah, we actually filled a truck with our application about 20 years ago. That's what it fits into, a uh, 18 wheeler uh, grocery truck. So drug development is really, really hard. I mean, there are, uh, new innovation is always hard, but uh, it's, uh, I've been doing this for about 25 years, uh, uh, trying to uh, develop drugs in the neuroscience space, and it's really, really hard. Um, and there are lots of reasons for clinical trial failure. I told you about 12% success rate, right? And the reason for failure is illustrated in this uh, nature review and drug discovery. So about, half of the uh, clinical trial failure is due to a lack of efficacy, okay? And second reason is for safety, okay? And there are miscellaneous reasons. You know, you have a different strategy, you don't think you can compete in the market. Um, commercial reason, you don't think you can get reimbursed by uh, Medicare or insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why wouldn't you have efficacy after spending 10 years of studying this compound? Well, there could be a number of reasons. The animal models that you use to predict efficacy may not be correct. Animals always will not tell you whether your drug will work or not. Perhaps your study design is not well designed. Maybe you, are, you haven't designed it. The gold standard, obviously, is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, right? Okay. So while that is a gold standard, there are different, there are different uh, variations of, of, of design and statistical analysis that can go wrong. Patient selection, okay? Diabetic patients. Alzheimer's patients is not a single disease. I mean, these patients have multiple disease, multiple drugs that they're taking. So when you pick a patient in a clinical trial, they're not really always representative of people living uh, in the community, okay? A lot of the uh, 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 trials fail because in real life, you just don't have diabetes, right? You just don't have Parkinson's. You just don't have depression. You have a whole host of diseases. An average senior citizen in the United States takes how many drugs? Five, six, seven drugs every day. So if you throw those people into a clinical trial, okay, the number one reason why we cannot show efficacy is confounding variables, okay? And statistics just doesn't work when you have so many variables. So from the get-go, you have to really think about the real-life data our patients, are they going to be on only my therapy? Of course not. They're going to be on all sorts of medication, herbal remedies, et cetera, et cetera, A to Z, right? So what will those compounds do to my primary endpoint data? It could wreak havoc, okay? And your trials can fail, okay? So, 임상 실험을 할 때, 우리가 3차에 들어가서는 환자가 그 병만 가지고 있는 게 아니잖아요. 다른 약도 복용을 하고 다른 병도 있고 다른 상태도 있고 특별히 이 정신과 하고 신경내과는 제일 어려워요. 왜냐하면 항우울제를 개발할 때 만약에 환자가 로터를 따면 우울증 하루에 나요. 예, 예. 그렇죠? 그러면 우리 약효과인지 이 사람이 로터를 따서인지 저희는 알 수가 없죠. 그렇죠? 그러한 uh, compounding variable가 uh, 큰 문제예요. 
똑같은 그 리서치인데요. Uh, uh, Nature uh, Review and uh, Drug Discovery. So in 2013 through 2015, by therapeutic area, what we have seen, you can see that on, even in oncology, you know, we had about 30% failure, okay? And you could read the other um, indication, but every therapeutic area has a significant um, uh, uh, failure rate is, is the point. Phase one, we do phase one um, to establish safety and tolerability, but we actually do phase one to eliminate the drug. The cost of clinical trials, okay, gets exponentially expensive, okay? The animal studies, of course, are expensive, okay? But once you get into humans, that's when the real bucks, real money comes into play, okay? So during phase one, you're talking about anywhere from $5 million to $10 million, which is cheap in the whole scheme of spending $2 billion, okay, in drug development. So phase one, in some ways, is the goal is to say, hey, I want to kill off this compound. I want to find a reason why this drug won't make it, okay? So in phase one, we see a, 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 a lot of a commercial viability question being asked where we actually kill off or stop development in 40% of the compound due to commercial viability, okay? And uh, of course, we don't directly measure efficacy um, uh, in, in phase one, and the safety is short term, but uh, these are the data that is available uh, publicly. Okay, so early on, you have to ask yourself the, uh, the real question. Is my compound going to compete from an efficacy and a safety perspective in the commercial market? And that is one of the big business decisions that people make to uh, say whether we want to proceed to phase two or phase three. Um, so, I am a trained scientist, and I thought I was getting into science when I entered the drug development world. I describe myself as, uh, as a equally an artist uh, than as, as along with being a scientist, because drug development, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is no formula to develop new drugs. In a way, it is more of an art form to find ways to balance the benefits versus risk in science, regulation, and commercial viability. Let's take some example. We all know the famous drug Viagra, right? It's making about six and a half billion dollars uh, 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 per year, okay? Did Pfizer intend to develop Viagra as an erectile dysfunction drug? No. It was a heart medication. Viagra da isjo. Ige indication ni hepsimjin yagiyosyo. Ilsange. Ilsangeso yi bu jachungi natanan goyeo. Yeah, yeah. Kuse yi bu jachungi iyeonghe gajugo shinyak debake han gojo. Ika yi bu jachungi natanan gojo. 꼭 나쁜 것만은 아니에요. 왜냐하면 약이라는 게 저희가 타겟한 그 타겟에 가가지고 그 효과만 약 효과만 나타내는 게 아니라 다른 타겟도 다 건드릴 수 있거든요. 예, 그거를 specificity라고 하죠. It's very hard to target your drug to the only receptor that you're targeting. Okay? It's going to hit other receptors that are also present in other parts of the body. You know, I did a, uh, a phase two study for a big pharma for an um, uh, antidepressant, okay? 500 patient placebo control um, a depression uh, trial. And when I looked at the data, uh, it did no better than placebo. And by the way, placebo are very good medicine, okay? It has efficacy rate of about 20 to 40%, believe it or not. In depression, Placebo has about 30% efficacy, okay? So you have to beat 30%, which is very hard. So I had a failed, failed phase two drug with a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. But when we analyze the data, 
we recognize that the patients who took the active versus the placebo lost significant amount of weight, okay? So we turned the drug around and did a phase three on weight losing indication for phase three and succeeded and got the FDA approval. And it's now a marketed prescription drug for weight losing indication. And we scrapped the depression indication. So some, 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 some example, but there are plenty and plenty of, of, of stories like this. And uh, the point of my story is to tell you that just because it didn't work for one indication doesn't mean that you don't have potential in other areas. And uh, one has to really study the, the compound well for you to identify all the potential targets uh, that it could be used for. So this is called the three pillars to improve success of a drug development. Uh, colleagues at Pfizer, actually uh, research and development team at Pfizer came up with this concept, uh, which was developed to improve the odds of developing a successful drug. So exposure at the site of action. So it may seem like an obvious question, but traditionally we have not studied it. Does the drug get to the area of the body that it's supposed to work in? Okay, let's take an a, a Alzheimer's drug or, or depression drug. Of course, it works in the brain, right? Okay, so you would naturally think that the drug gets into the brain, right? Guess what? It's very hard to get things into the brain because there's a, a barrier called the BBB or the blood, uh, barrier, uh, blood brain barrier. So finding out whether the drug gets into the brain is very hard. And you know, all those uh, depression drugs and anxiety drugs that were developed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s that were submitted to the FDA, guess what? Nobody proved that the drug got into the brain. Nobody proved it. All we looked at was the symptomatic scores at phase three, and the FDA had to approve it because we just didn't have the techniques and the methods to do it. So the point is, a uh, drug at the exposure of the site binding to targets. Does my, is, if my drug is a dopamine receptor antagonist, does it go and bind at the dopamine receptor and which subtypes? Now, we didn't have the technology in the past to go into that molecular level. But guess what? Now we do. We have radio label ligands in which we could use PET, positron emission tomography, and radio uh, uh, label, label our drugs to see whether our drug is binding to not only the receptors, but the sub subtypes of receptors. Okay? So showing that your drug, this is all clinical, by the way. Our preclinical animal scientist, animal scientist did does all of this routinely. But what I'm saying is, you have to repeat this in humans, okay? Before we make a decision to proceed to phase two and beyond. Expression of pharmacology, okay? The animal scientists tell us, why do you have to repeat that? <laughs> we show that in animals. We show that the enzyme was inhibited, there was inhibition. We targeted the protein in dogs, in monkeys. Why do we have to show that in humans? Because animal models are only so good, okay? They have to re repeat it in humans. I'm gonna just run through some examples to show you how drugs are being developed to de-risk the development for phase two and phase three. Phase two is expensive. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, okay? Before you go there, phase one used to think, they used to think, oh, we just have to prove that the drug is safe and tolerable and get into through the gut, okay? Now, because of the big investment involved in the drug development journey, we are putting more emphasis on phase one and try to get as much information as possible. I can't cover all therapeutic areas, so I'm going to give an example of what we do in the central nervous system space. So the background is that 
phase one used to be only considered be considered in the healthy volunteers, but healthy volunteers are not patients, okay? And uh, the patients may respond differently than healthy volunteers. So getting patients into your phase one program, which has been done historically in oncology, but oncology only because these were toxic drugs, chemotherapy, right? You couldn't give it to healthy volunteers. So that's why we had to give it to uh, cancer patients. But now we are getting patients in with diabetes, immunology, rheumatology, everything into patients as soon as possible, okay? I'm gonna skip a couple of these slides. To the, the, the time factor. So this concept of a maximum tolerate, MTD stands for maximum tolerated dose, okay? is not the same in healthy volunteers compared to target patient population. And I'll give you some example. So this line is the maximum tolerated dose in healthy volunteers, okay? And when I did, these are all my experiments, which are published. When I did repeated experiment in patients with Alzheimer's disease, the maximum tolerated dose was, in this case, 75% to 100% higher in healthy volunteers. Now, the animal scientists, from three clinical colleagues, have told me that one milligram, two milligram, whatever the dose might be, is enough to treat this indication with this drug. But often, the animal models does not work. I'll give you an illustration. Ribostigmine is an Alzheimer's drug that me and my colleagues uh, uh, developed for Novartis uh, Pharmaceutical, the, the, sweet, uh, 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 the Swiss company. <laughs> and this is pub, uh, published work by uh, my colleagues and I uh, in the journal, uh, uh, Neurology Journal. So Novartis went to phase two and um, they predicted that six milligram of the drug was going to be efficacious based on the preclinical model and the phase one uh, study. And we did another study to see how much more drug we can give to Alzheimer's patients. And we were able to increase the dose up to 12 milligrams uh, and it was tolerated by uh, by patients with Alzheimer's disease. And as part of the revisiting of the drug development, so you sung as a law, you got Tatumasa, Modon PK, Anjong Sung Shiram, Tatumaga, Yumirika, Hedaju, face to the hand in there, negative yourself, face to that. 어, 그래서 이 약을 포기하려고 했는데 어, 너무나 아까워가지고 저희 연구소에 어, 노벌티스가 찾아왔어요. 그래서 저희가 다시 재검토를 했어요. 어, 그래서 임상 양리 실험을 다시 해봤습니다. 그래서 6mg가 어, 아니고 어쩌면 더 높은 용량이 필요하지 않을까 실험을 해가지고 저희가 12mg까지도 uh, 환자에게 투약을 할수 있다고 저희가 재실험, uh, 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 재검토를 했어요. 재평가를 했습니다. 일상을 다시 돌아간 거죠. 그래서 이, 이 상에 들어가기, 다, 다시 들어가기 전에 그 임상 양리 바이오마커 실험을 다시 해봤습니다. 그래서 12mg을 투여한 다음에 이거는 혈중 농도입니다. 예, 예. 어, 혈중하고 어, 어, CSF, 그러니까 어, 어, spinal fluid 농도를 보고 이거는 그 enzyme inhibition을 저희가 플라팅을 했어요. 보다시피 이 12mg에서 제일 높은 효과를 저희가 아, 나타냈습니다. 따라서 이 실험을 그 어, 노파티스가 어, 추천한 용량 2mg부터 12mg까지 저희가 테스트를 해봤을 때이 임상 양리 그 엔자임 액티비티를 저희가 플라트했습니다. We plotted the, the, the pharmacologic activity 
of the, the, the models recommend that those of two milligram against the higher doses of, of up to 12 milligram uh, showed those and uh, those response that were pretty consistent with uh, linear increases in, in pharmacologic activity. And therefore, we repeated the phase two with the lower doses that, the, uh, that we thought was, was gonna be efficacious uh, and with the higher doses uh, of six to 12 mill uh, milligram. And you can see that the efficacy, the p-value of the higher doses were significantly higher than the lower doses. And this is what got us the FDA approval, okay, of this drug. And uh, we'll of course have to see whether the safety and tolerability was acceptable uh, with the higher doses. These are a number of patients, a uh, percentage of patients uh, withdrawn due to adverse events. And uh, while it was higher than the placebo or the lower doses, it was seemed to be acceptable uh, uh, compared to the potential effect of, of the drug. 이번에 한 사례예요, 저희가. 근데 이러한 사례들이 굉장히 많아요. 저희가 그, 어, 어, 30년 동안 이 임상 실험을 어, 어, 해본 스토리들은 진짜 끝도 없습니다. 아, 어떤 약은 저희가 100%로 이거는 성공할 거라고 믿고 들어갔는데 안된 케이스도 있고, 어, 이거는 뉴 인클라스고, 메커니즘도 새롭고, 그렇으면 힘들잖아요. 어, 근데 이러한 일상에서 하는 그 임상 양력 실험을 하고 이상에 들어갔을 경우에는 저희가 성공할 수 있는 사례들이 어, 굉장히 많았습니다. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about some, some practical aspects of uh, running clinical trials. So if you ask me in 1970, um, who did clinical trials? Uh, because uh, let me step back. Drug companies, of course, uh, have the, the compounds and they have uh, the, the management and the sponsorship put up the money to develop drug, of course. But um, Pfizer doesn't have a hospital, right? <laughs> Not that I know of, right? <laughs> they can't run clinical trials uh, by themselves, right? So they have to go to hospitals and academic institutions to run clinical trials. So if you ask me in 1970, who did clinical trials? Of course, the medical schools, the pharmacy schools, the dental schools, the professors, the academics did the, the clinical trials on behalf of the drug companies. If you ask me today, who does clinical trials, I can confidently tell you is company like mine or contract research organization, okay? So we are known as a CRO, okay? So we are the ones that uh, work with the pharmaceutical industry to um, manage and develop the, the, the drug on behalf of the biopharmaceutical company. So just to give you an idea of the, the, the CRO um, uh, business activity, in 2019, our market was about $34 billion. Okay, that's again what a B. Okay, so our market activity is about $34 billion. And the CAGR uh, for the next uh, five years or so is expected to be about 8.2%. Okay, so that is a, a, a very um, a big growth. So. It used to be that the drug companies used to manage these clinical trials in-house, right? So this is no different than other businesses where companies are outsourcing uh, the activities of uh, uh, even development activities for pharmaceuticals, okay? So this market is growing and growing and growing because the market forces tells us that it is more efficient to hire people like us than to do some of the activities in-house. Let's take an example. If I were Pfizer and I need to do 100 statistical analysis and I need 50 statisticians to do that, does it make sense for have a 50, have 50 full-time statisticians? Of course not. It's more efficient to hire 
a CRO who has statisticians available and pay them on an hourly rate to do the statistical analysis, correct? So the market, market forces are pushing uh, for the outsourcing of clinical trials. Now that's true in big pharma, okay? So Merck, Lilly, Bristol Meyer, Pfizer of the world, their outsourcing is growing and growing and growing every, every year. And you can see that the about more than half, okay? Um, so in clinical trials, you could have regulatory affair activity like filing INDs, interaction with the FDA, you could have uh, clinical trials, uh, statistics, data management activities, laboratory activities, uh, phase three trials, uh, phase one trials. So you can see that more than half of all these activities are being outsourced to contract research organization compared to doing it in-house uh, for, for uh, efficiency sake. Now, if you are a biotech company, this is almost 100%, okay? 90 to 100%. A lot of the biotech companies will have what? Five, six, seven, eight, 50 employees to do global development. Impossible, right? So do you want to hire 3,000 people to run your trial? Of course not. So you uh, contract with a, uh, a CRO to run your uh, phase three trials. And uh, that's the way uh, the trials are done. So uh, our, our clients are, are both uh, biotech companies. Almost uh, all biotech companies uh, uh, will source out their activities. Uh, but as I mentioned, even the big pharma uh, are outsourcing a lot of this activity to uh, companies like ours. And the last slide is the CRO selection process. So if I'm a biotech in LA, San Diego, Cambridge, Boston, San Francisco. And the, by, uh, by the way, the biotech boom is not only a Korean phenomenon. Ohio, Korea is a very hot place. I was in Boston, Cambridge last week. And between MIT and Harvard, it's only what, five blocks, right? Yeah, yeah. Between MIT and, and Harvard is, is Cambridge, right? I counted how many drug companies there were <laughs> in that neighborhood. Guess how many? Anybody can, anybody can guess? 500, about 500 companies, okay? Uh, spin out from MIT and then Harvard and Boston, uh, called Boston University, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, venture firms, uh, investment, the law firms, they're all in it, okay? South San Francisco, same thing. San Diego, Los Angeles. These are all hubs of biotech activity, okay? So um, it's a booming industry and the CRO is going to be a, a necessary partner uh, to run your clinical trials, okay? So the, the selection process for CRO is, to, is no different than uh, bidding for a project in other businesses, architecture, construction, what have you, okay? So you create a request for proposal, okay? So in phase one, maybe you need to uh, file an IND with the FDA. So you request that service uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a service provided by the CRO. And then you say, oh, I, I also need phase one um, clinical trial. So you have to create a RFP or a request for proposal. And you send to qualified CROs, and then you usually have a RFP uh, Q&A session uh, with the uh, uh, bidders, if you will, uh, of the RFP. And you usually like to have a scoring uh, activity between the proposal based on budget, timeline, experience, quality, et cetera. So no different than, than other types of businesses. And then you would invite the finalists for a bit defense, okay? So uh, you invite maybe two or three top candidates uh, who would run your clinical trials and you will have a face-to-face -face meeting, okay? Where they will present their plans for running your phase one trial or phase two trial or phase three trials, how they're gonna do it, who their experts are, who their medical uh, uh, doctors are, their scientists, et cetera. And then you finalize the scoring after a face-to-face -face bid defense, okay? 
And then you request a detailed budget and finalize the scope of your work, and then you contract with the CRO. Now, this process may seem like a simple process, but guess what? Guess how many clinical studies you have to do in an MBA? MBA application is 아까 말씀드렸죠, 10만 페이지예요. Okay? 그 안에 임상 실험이 몇 개나 들어갈 수도 같아요. <웃음> 아니, 그 반결 안 되고 <웃음> 임상 실험을 대충 잡아서 한 스물다섯 번 해야 돼요. 예, 예. 왜 이렇게 많냐? 이상 상상은 그렇게 많이 안 해도 돼요. 일상 실험을 한 열다섯 번 하는 게 스무 번 해야 돼요. 이 약물이 안전한가? 그게 그게 쉬운 그 퀘스천이 아니에요. 이 약을 노인한테 주면 어떠한 현상이 일어날? 아이 소아한테 주면 어떻게 일어, 무슨 현상이 일어나는지, 오케이? 그리고 이 약이 동양인이 먹으면 외국인하고 비슷한 결과가 나오는지, 이 약을 빈속에 먹어야 되는지, 식후에 먹어야 되는지, 이 모든 하나 하나의 퀘스천이 임상 시험을 통해서 문답이 되는 거예요. 그 때문에 이러한 임상 양 실험을 대충 잡아서 열다개 열다섯에서 한 스무 번을 해야 되고, 그 다음에 이상을 하는데. 이상도 한 두세 번은 해야지 감이 잡혀요. 왜냐하면 이 디자인이 다 틀리고 그렇기 때문에 이상에서 확실히 이그그 그 파일럿트 POC를 하지 않으면 삼상 들어가는데 큰 위험 부담을 갖고 들어가거든요. 삼상도 어 저희가 피베탈 트라이라고 그러죠. Registration trial. We uh, for phase three. I'm sorry. I went rambling on in Korean, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to come back to English. Um, so phase uh, clinical trials, there are about 25 studies that we have to do. And, uh, and, and, and all these uh, 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 processes are involved in each one of these um, uh, clinical protocols. So um, the question is, do you have to work with just one CRO? Of course not. I mean, I would love that, but <laughs> the answer is of course not. There are hundreds of CROs in, in, in this world, okay? And you're not bound to work with just one research organization, okay? Um, you could actually pick several CROs, um, and that's, I think, some of the mentality, especially from my Asian pharmaceutical company. They say, oh, I, signed, I did phase one with X company. I feel obligated to continue my development with that company for phase two? Absolutely not. You have no obligation whatsoever. It's your money, okay? It's your money, it's your choice. You can pick and mix, mix and match as many CROs as you want, okay? Our world, this drug development activity is so complicated that no one company or no one CRO can do all this work. So while I am a for-profit research uh, contract organization, on a typical day, I would be working with five of my competitors, <laughs> okay? <laughs> plus, plus three or four consultants that have to come, that comes along with the pharmaceutical company, okay? So every day I'm working with Icuria, for those who are in the industry might know this name, PPD, Covance. Okay, these are my direct competitors, okay? But these activities are so complicated that I have to work with all my competitors, okay? So you can always mix and match. You don't have to stick with just one CRO, okay? And you have to find the expertise from each of the company where you need it the most. For example, if you're doing phase one in certain indication, neuroscience, endocrine, you have to ask yourself, who has the most experience in this indication? Who has the track record, okay? Drug development is not academia. There is no book for it, okay? Experience matters, okay? So you want to go, of course, you don't want to blow your budget, but experience matters in, in drug development. And, um, uh, the MBA has 15 sections, okay? Clinical is just one, okay? Chemistry, manufacturing, quality control, 
<laughs> biology, pathology. So no one person or one company actually should be able to answer, okay, all these clinical questions. FDA has experts from chemistry all the way to clinical medicine, right? Yeah. So you too have to have that type of expertise in 15 disciplines, at least, that will be contained uh, in your um, um, uh, uh, MBA dossier. So uh, my concluding message is, while the CRO does your work, the ultimate responsibility lies with the sponsor, right? Yeah, yeah. It lies with you, okay? Of course, we provide the expertise and walk with you, but at the end of the day, you have the IT, we don't. We don't have any IT uh, in these, and, and that's the way we like it because, you know, we don't want to be biased, okay, when we're trying to develop new drugs, right? And that's the way that he likes it too, okay? So you have to ask yourself, I'm responsible at the end of the day, okay? Not the CRO. You can't, you can't blame the CRO. Okay, you own the product, okay? And it's your job to do the due diligence, okay? To find which CRO has the most experience, the most capability, and the most communication ability uh, with you. There's also culture, right? Yeah, yeah, expertise and culture, there's a lot. And then you have to also balance that with business decisions like budget and timeline, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, uh, the, the, the last message I'd like to uh, leave with you. So a couple of take home messages. Drug development is very expensive and very hard. I think I shared that with you and I can't emphasize enough of, uh, of how hard this is. It has to be multidisciplinary and collaborative. No one CRO, no one drug company, no one agency have all the answers, okay? Yeah, FDA doesn't have all the answers, okay? There are many world-class regulatory agencies along with the FDA, EMEA, PMDA, NMPA from for China. All these agencies have to collaborate. So you have to be speaking with all of these agencies, speak with the academics, speak with the CROs, and speak with other pharmaceutical companies, okay, that have similar interests uh, in, 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 the, in your uh, area of, of development. And but always remember, you are responsible, okay? The sponsor is responsible for uh, CRO selection and every decision-making um, uh, that, that goes into product development. And your job is to do the do, do, do diligence uh, that is uh, required by you and the investor and the patients and the doctors uh, at large. So that is my concluding uh, remark. And I would like to open up for questions and answers. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, are there any questions on the floor? Yes, question in the front. Uh, yes, one of the things that uh, I'm very much involved in for the last 50 years is in the area of ethnic. And uh, for instance, I have a large uh, National Medical Association, all black doctors, 35,000 of them. And the, I also am very much involved with Latinos mm -hmm. and to some extent Asians. But in the United States, do you, and, and of course, we know these are high frequency players in different areas diabetes. Right, right, right. Heart Hypertension. Okay. Uh, how much effect does that have when an REO is looking for candidates? Mm -hmm. Do they look for those ethnic? mixes based upon the population base yeah. after being 50% yeah. of everything. Right, right, right. So I'd like to repeat the question and if you don't mind, uh, translate it into Korean. So the question is, when we develop these, these drugs, a uh, uh, gentleman is very interested in uh, ethnic uh, difference, okay? African-American versus white versus Latin-American versus Asians. When we develop drugs, how much uh, do we take that into consideration uh, when we develop this drug. 그러니까 이분의 질문은 우리가 신약 개발을 할때 미국 같은 경우 한국에는 뭐 다, 한국 분들이지만 미국 같은 경우에는 어, 흑인도 있고 어, 라틴계도 있고 아시안도 있는데 저희가 신약을 개발할 때 어, 이러한 
업종에 대한 팩터를 얼만큼 고려하는지 가 질문이었습니다. So to answer your question, as with many things in life, it's case by case. So we actually have this discipline called ethnopharmacology. It's a study of ethnic factors in drug development. And this is a new uh, uh, area of discipline. And I'm very active uh, in this area. I uh, have written uh, dozens of papers and actually several books on this topic of ethnicity and, and, and drug response. So what we try to do is find what the evidence for potential difference might be. Like you said, there are more diabetics in Africa, in, in Hispanics, for example, okay? Certain type of hypertension, more African Americans, right? Yeah. Certain type of hepatitis, Asians have certain gene mutations that are more prevalent in Asia, okay? So we first look at pathology and say, where are the areas where there are genetic or empirical differences in the ethnic difference of that population, okay? That's number one. And secondly, we look at drug metabolism, okay? So there are absolutely differences in drug metabolism between ethnicities, okay? I'll give one quick example to take home the message. Um, when Asians drink alcohol, we get what we call the Asian flush, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and that's not because we are weak when it comes to alcohol. Our enzymes are lacking in metabolizing alcohol, okay? Uh, namely aldehyde dehydrogenase. White people have no shortage of this enzyme, okay? So they can drink, the, the cows come home, okay? But Asians, up to 26% have a lack in this enzyme. That's why we come, alcohol is a drug, right? So this is a prime example of difference in doses that we can give to different ethnic group. So if the drug has a propensity to metabolize differently in different ethnic group, and that can be studied because of the wonderful world we live in called uh, uh, genetics. We can actually look at genes to, to see whether you are likely to metabolize this drug differently than your Caucasian counterpart or your Asian counterpart, okay? So I hope that answers your question. Well, yeah. the other factor that I find, uh -huh. and I've been doing this for 50 years, uh -huh. is cultural yeah. and dietetic. Yeah. And for instance, looking for those people who aren't taking any drugs, right. Right. Uh, you'll find within the black community a larger percentage of those people. Right. And also, based on which sub, uh, country from South America, mm -hmm. there'll be large segments of the people right. that they're clean right, from the right, standpoint right, right, of right. being suspects, and right. they come down with the disease. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want there's, there's uh, other things. Yeah. Other you make a very good point. The point is, there are cultural differences, okay, uh, including diet that dictates different response to medications, okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm Social, cultural, medical practice got Nara Mada Tio. Yeah, yeah. For example, I, examples are always easier than trying to explain things, right? Guess what? In Japan, the doses of drugs, okay, are on average 40% less than that of American patients. Does that mean the drug is only efficacious in 60%, okay, uh, here, and then we have to give more drugs? Of course not. Drug dosage and drug uh, prescribing and the response is a very complicated phenomenon and interaction between doctor, patients, cultural norms, what is acceptable in society. For example, mental illness in Japan, Asia, <laughs> is, not, is not accepted, okay? It's not accepted. Therefore, nobody comes to the clinic to get treated. Side effect, tolerance. 동양 사람들은 그 약에 대한 부작용에 대해서 굉장히 민감해요. 일본에서는 부작용이 조금에도 나타나는 약은 안 먹어요, 환자들이. 그렇기 때문에 용량을 우리가 40%를 줄여야 돼요. 예. 용량. 40%를 줄여야 돼요. 그게 현실이고. 
그 때문에 이 약의 반응이라는 것은 과학적인 문제가 아니고 문화적인 문제고 환자들이 그 어, 어, 접할 수 있는 그 tolerance level, 의사들이 접할 수 있는 그, 그 tolerance level. 이게 다 틀려요. 그 때문에 이 신약을 개발을, 이게, 그, 어, 전, 인터넷 글로벌 신약을 개발한다는 거는 굉장히 복잡한 문제예요, 실은. 예. 그렇기 때문에 저희가 상상을 할 때, 미국에서만 해볼 수 있는 게 안돼요. 저희는 보통 한열 나라에서 스물 나라를 픽해가지고 상상을 합니다. 그래서 phase three trials, typical story. <웃음> I get carried away with my Korean. Um, to do a typical phase three study, we actually pick about 15 to 20 countries because of these differences, not only in physiology, but also in cultural uh, nature in terms of patient's acceptance. The medical doctor and the patient relationship and the tolerance for efficacy and safety are different, okay? Uh, as well as dietary factors and whatnot, okay? Some countries are taking or medicines that are food. There are many foods that are actually medicines, right? In, for example, in China, in Asian countries, in India, okay? So all of these things have to be calculated when we arrive at what is called efficacy, okay? That's why it's very hard for us to tease all these factors out. You, know, you will not only have a patient with, with that disease, okay? So let's say you develop a cancer, uh, cancer drug, okay? A breast cancer or, or, or a stomach cancer. So you identify these patients with the uh, gastric cancer to put in your clinical trials, okay? The patients in the US, okay, might be getting some standard therapy, okay? What is the standard therapy in India, okay? <laughs> right? What are the other drugs that the patients will be taking in Uzbekistan or Pakistan, okay, or Iraq, okay? How do you manage all this confounding variable into the one outcome, the response, tumor response rate, okay? You want to see that tumor shrink, right? In the images, in your PET images. But that response had multiple, multiple inputs. Those culture, doctor practice, concomitant medication, standard of therapy is very complicated. So to deal with this, you have to have a super computer, super statistical models, okay? It's a problem. At the end of the day, this is a statistical problem, okay? And it's very complicated, okay? Uh, just a couple of ANOVAs won't do, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Uh, so from the get-go, all of our research has to be a prospective analysis. FDA is not interested in a retrospective analysis, okay? After using your phase three, you can't go back and say, hey, this is what we saw and this, we think this is why it's true. You can't say that. You have to have a hypothesis set forth before your trial, statistical analysis plan, right? SAP, okay, SAP for short. You have to say, if X, Y, then X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Prospectively, you have to have a statistical plan to tell the FDA if these things happen, these are the variables, and these are the outcome that we expect. Okay, without that, we're not gonna do it. Okay, another question, yeah. So Dr. G, um, regarding the, you were saying, obviously you work for a CRO, but as a, a smaller biotech, have you in your, uh, experience seeing that it's advantageous to for a biotech company to work with multiple CROs or to stick with one when it, in terms of FDA and in terms of yeah. collecting data from multiple yeah. sites yeah. and things yeah. like this. Yeah. So um, the question is, as a small bio, biotech company, do you find that advantageous to work with a, uh, a single CRO versus multiple CRO? And uh, again, what the, most things in life, uh, it depends on where you're at, okay? So if, uh, I, if I can generalize, I can't uh, speak to all the different situation. Um, so, 죄송합니다. 제가 한국말로 다시 저기, uh, 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 인터뷰를 한 다음에 답을 줄게요. 드릴게요. Uh, 질문이, 만약에 제가 바이오텍 컴퍼니면, 어, 제 경험으로 볼 때, 어, 다수의 CRO하고 같이 일하는 게 유익한지, 아니면 어, 어, 단한 회사랑 일하는 게더 유리한지 어, 질문이었습니다. So to answer your question, 
I think in the early phase, okay, in IMD filing and uh, phase one, uh, the, the, I think the, uh, the fear is, is, is probably okay, okay, even one, because, you know, you have a very concrete uh, endpoint in mind, right? Yeah, you only have uh, two or three clinical studies that are uh, critical path to you getting into phase two, right? So you, there are not that many uh, um, uh, work to do for five CROs to jump in into a phase one protocol, okay? But as you move to phase two and phase three, okay, you might consider multiple CROs because, you know, maybe one is, like if you have to run two uh, uh, phase uh, two studies uh, in parallel in, 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 in US and one in Asia, one in Europe, Okay, one in US or several phase two programs globally, you have to consider expertise and the, the, the time and the effort that the CRO can give you. Okay, all CROs are working with every company out there. Okay, My, I'm working with about 500 companies. Okay, at this present time, I'm having 20,000 employees. Okay, uh, in 85 countries, right? So you have to ask, is this CRO going to give me enough time? Okay, for my project, are they going to put Pfizer, <laughs> okay, project above my project? I think that's a very critical question. You should not be embarrassed to ask that question to a CRO. How many clients do you have that's studying your indication in phase two study right now? And how many projects are you running? Okay, so expertise is a given, but operational question like, how many other competing trials are you doing for other companies? Okay, and how are you going to guarantee that you're going to give my project enough time and effort for it to be successful? I think it's a, it's a, it's a very um, uh, 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 obvious question you have to ask yourself. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, earlier, I think you could get away with IND filing, with uh, phase one, uh, maybe one or two CRO uh, can be enough, uh, but uh, down the road, these multinational, uh, uh, multi uh, phase two B and three studies, they're monsters. You're talking about recruiting thousands of patients in 20, 25, 30 countries, okay? Uh, I don't think uh, for any uh, big CRO, that's gonna be easy, right? So, 한마디로 제가 간략하게 말씀을 드리면, 초기 인상에서는 뭐한 회사, 두 회사 같이 일하는 게 괜찮을 수도 있습니다. 그러면 일상을 뭐한두세 과제를 하면 페이스 투로 들어갈 수 있거든요. 뭐 승공하고 뭐뭐 모티 도스, 뭐 프라셉트 이런 것들 하면 이상으로 들어갈 수 있기 때문에. 근데 이상 삼창에 들어가면 굉장히 일이 복잡해져요. 어, 그리고 이 새로운 회사들이 많은 모든 회사하고 같이 일을 해요. 어, 저희 회사 들어가지고 몇백 회사랑 같이 일하기 때문에 아무리 직원이 많아도 그 안에 회사에 줄수 있는 리소스가 뭐 무한정이 아니거든요. 예. 그 때문에 그 이상 들어갈 때 제일 중요한 것은 그 세로를 픽할 때, 물론 경험, 그, 엑스퍼티스, 어, 어, 전문성도 중요하지만 그 오퍼레이셔널 카파시티가 얼마큼 있는지. 예, 예. 그러면 환자를 제일 중요한 것은 the most important thing in, 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 in clinical trials, patient selection. Okay, what type of patients are you putting into? Because you can only describe the idea of patients for your protocol in so many ways, okay? I mean, we typically have 25 inclusion and 25 exclusion criteria, anything from age, sex, gender, you know, concomitant, but even that won't do justice because, you know, there's hundreds of, of variables that you can consider. So uh, patient recruitment is by largest the biggest challenge of fulfilling a phase 2B or phase 3 clinical trials. And I'm not saying that certain companies does this, but when the pressure really hits, okay? When the pressure, you, I'm a CRO, I promised, you know, uh, Eli Lilly that, that I would put in a thousand diabetics, okay, in two years, okay? I'm at year uh, one and I'm at 200. This is all hypothetical, by the way, okay? <laughs> Oh, hypothetical. Uh, and year one, I'm only at 200 patients. Okay? What do you think is going to happen? I'm going to do whatever it takes to put in those patients to fulfill my end 
Will that impact quality? There's a possibility, right? You're under concern, you're under pressure, right? Yeah. So these are all very important operational consideration in the selection and management of, 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 of clinical trials. And these contracts, uh, we have many attorneys here, these contracts are not set in stone, okay? Uh, you should be very careful in having a legal review to make sure that your milestones are met. And there are consequences if those milestones are not met, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, it goes back to you being the ultimately responsible. So the, the, the question is, you, we have to try to find out what we don't know, okay? You don't know what you don't know, okay? <laughs> and I'm not putting down uh, my Korean colleagues, okay? But Korea is new compared to Europe and the U.S. in terms of, of, of drug development, right? Yeah. So we have to ask ourselves, do we not know what we don't know? You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. You have to come to U.S. as, uh, as uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Kim, pointed out. U.S. is the biggest market in the world, okay? Uh, not even China and Japan can even come close to the market size of, of, of U.S., uh, despite the China being such a big country, not even close uh, to the U.S. market. So, of course, that's why all the companies are coming here to, to develop the drug in, in, in the U.S. So, uh, I, I welcome that, and I have uh, many uh, Asian companies, not only Korean, Japanese, Chinese companies, coming to the U.S. for clinical development. It makes sense because this is the market. You want to develop where the market is, right? Uh, but it's a foreign land, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have to find out what you don't know and, and try to make sure that you address all the, the elements uh, from contracts to budgets to quality management to audits to X, Y, Z. I mean, there's a list goes on and on and on. Uh, so uh, I think it's just, a, uh, it's not a rocket science. Uh, it's a matter of just going out and meeting people like me, people at UCLA, people at USC, you know, I mean, it takes a village, I, you know, our company cannot do this, you know, on our own. We need uh, my, my, my colleagues at the academic world at UCLA, USC, um, you know, Caltech, all these people, uh, we work together on a daily basis. So I encourage you to, you know, um, uh, meet with people from all disciplines uh, 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 to, to um, to discuss your clinical plans. 그 여기서도 질문이 좋지만 만약에 웹엑스에도 질문이 있으면 제가 어, 답변할 수 있습니다. 네, 온라인으로. 네, 아, 아, 지금 더 이상 질문은 없는 것 같습니다. 예. 아, 그러면 아, 큰 박수 부탁드리겠습니다. 예. 땡큐, 감사합니다. Uh,그러면以上으로그두분의발표를마치도록하겠습니다아시청자분들은그온라인을떠나시기전에설문조사를해주시면감사하겠습니다아그리고기도ESA구독을눌러주시면어저희녹화영상과다음웹이나정보를